Well, we're talking about <clears throat> the short-term, long-term thinking, which has turned into an extreme dichotomy across sort of people's approach to business. And I think it gets exacerbated at the public company level where they're managing from quarter to quarter earnings and they have to give these analysts a picture of, hey, I'm gonna make you know, 35 cents per share next, next you know, month. And then there's all this sort of accounting tricks and stuff like that to smooth those earnings and manage the, those earnings so that they hit that, that accurate thing. And what that ends up doing is taking your eye off of what the true mission of the organization is. And that gets superseded by, I gotta hit next quarter. So what you're actually saying, I think, is that it's not about me making more money this quarter. It's about me being along, being around for the next hundred years or something. And right. when, when your viewpoint shifts from this, like this myopic view that really has only, only room for one thing when that's a stack of coins um, to a longer term timeline, then you can make those sort of sometimes, you know, contrary decisions or whatever, where you say, okay, I got to shift over here and I got to take care of these assets. I got to pour some more money, so, so to speak, into these assets, these assets being my people, if I want not only the company to be around on the back end, but for my folks to come back when we emerge from this thing uh, energized and know, knowing that, hey, the, the culture that we've built and the values that we built are actually real and they can hang their hat on those and they can count on those things. And that's how an organization, I think, is going to be able to emerge from this you know, in a stronger position. Yeah, I don't think I could ever run anything that was driven, that was publicly traded, not that that opportunity would ever come about, but it, I just- Because of the beard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that and uh, the, the um, 11 quarter to quarter thing, um, I think some can do it. I think some can, say to shareholders for the moment, uh, dividends and stock price are going to be second to taking care of the people right now. There are people who can actually turn that message into a, an asset or a benefit. Mm. It's, it's hard because shareholders are pretty ruthless. Uh, it's pretty funny. Here's another observation I got is that everybody talks about how terrible big business is and how terrible big companies, how terrible it is to you know, live quarter to quarter and all that. And then when they go look at their 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 investments and they they and they they got big money in a certain company and that company isn't being ruthless enough, and and cons, you know focused on the stock price they they, they they flip now they're all cons, they become the problem. There, there are people who literally complain about both things. Why aren't you being more ruthless and making my stock price go up? And then why aren't you being a civil human being? In, in a situation like this, um, you know, it, 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 you, you got to be able to outsmart it. You got to save money. You got to put money away for, for tough times. You got to be able to overlook the, the, the pressures from shareholders, particularly big shareholders. Uh, but, but ultimately, uh, I think you're seeing some company, companies going back private just to get away from this nightmare we've created. Yeah, well, that, I think it's one of those unintended consequences where, again, there's these, there's a whole, you know, slew of uh, unintended incentives that folks are actually responding to because this, the guy running the company has all these stock options that are only going to vest if the stock continues to go up, and it's only going to go up to your point if it is a, uh, you know, the expected return is what you know, the actual return is in line with the expected return and that's going to be all built by the analysts and what they think is going to happen and does that actually happen and all these other things end up sort of superseding what's going on. And when, th when that company goes back private, at least in theory, some of those unintended consequences or externalities can kind of be removed, but sometimes they fall back into yeah. the same thing. <laughs> like <laughs> the private equity firm has to go and raise their next fund or, oh, or those right. Talk are. about That's a whole nother world is, is, uh, investors you know that you know, that private equity and all that uh but think about where this conversation has gone this is all about integrity right aligning your values morals principles what you believe to be true to your actions and your words there's all these things can inter interfere with it mm -hmm. so um we're just about to launch any day now the first couple podcasts but i'm doing a podcast called discovering integrity with a woman named Andra Pulpa, who is a long time, very, very creative, interesting compliance professional, comes at our world from a very different angle. 
very creative uh, angle. And we're going to talk about integrity. And, and you think about this, it's, it's, it's like a virus almost, you know, in the sense that integrity can, or the lack of it can infect any or many, many aspects of life. And so, uh, again, I will constantly bring people back to study conflicts of interest, study bias, study of uh, uh, critical thinking so that when you say something you know that it's true and you won't give people the impression that you lack integrity because you you didn't think through something before you said it and ended up being wrong and now they think you lack integrity the the the, the, the basics i'm going to come come back to the basics <laughs> it probably ought to be a summary of every show is okay we wandered off into some really interesting stuff but let's get back to how you and I can change today or tomorrow or prove, improve by tools. And uh, like there's at the end of every chapter, there's some kind of lesson plan. Um, actionable steps that will get us to be have more integrity. That's what I want everybody to think about. These other discussions are really fascinating. The finger pointing, Ariely's a millionaire and I'm not. And uh, so uh, there's a lot to be gained from going to this finger pointing theoretical academic. Yeah, but it turns into navel gazing and it's not actually doing anything at some level unless it's actually changing behaviors or perspectives that are you know, exhibited in, in the real world. That, that may be ultimately why I wrote the book, is that for 24 years, roughly, since I started with Debbie Trokos and Brent Saunders, SCCE, or HECA, which eventually turned into an international all-industry organization, is that the, the navel gazing and the, the, the philosophical, you know, get by a pulpit and tell everybody to do the right thing <laughs> was not effective in my opinion. And so in my final act, I rebelled against all of the navel gazers, the pointer sisters, the finger pointers. Uh, and I, I said, here's something that I think has substance and actionable steps. It, my, I can feel my retirement side of me coming out here, getting a little bit more ornery or in people's because that's just that's just going to irritate a whole lot of people, and I'm kind of like, so well, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> don't call me. Hit me on LinkedIn. Um, so I loved. Uh, I want to come back to this thing. You you were, you were talking about being like manic about you know you got to be a business person and you have to recognize the people and you have to be able to create. You have to be able to hold both of those things, and that's a hard thing to do. It's harder to hold two things than it is to hold one thing. Yeah, it's harder to keep that that sort of balancing game going. And um, you talked about something else that I think is what could maybe, you know, if you want to get down to like an actionable tip, is something that you can embed into your culture for somebody listening um, that I think you've kind of talked about and referenced a couple of times. And this is this idea of like an idea meritocracy where you're like, listen, this right. is my idea. We can have like a civil discourse about this. We can have a civil debate about this. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'm open to being wrong. Get some more people and, and, and convince me this is not, you know, me slamming a gavel down and telling you to keep your head down and don't meet my eyes because how dare you? <laughs> that type of thing, right? right. Um, why is that so hard for people to, why, why is that idea of meritocracy so hard uh, to embed on your team? And how does sort of intellectual honesty or dishonesty relate to this in terms of integrity? Oh, there's so many thoughts running through my head. One of them is odd that you've got to be pretty confident. You've got to have a pretty gigantic ego to say, argue with me, debate with me, tell me I'm wrong. I'm going to listen for long enough to make sure I know what you're talking about. And then I'm either going to agree or I'm going to run your derriere over because you may not understand it, but what you want to do is going to interfere with the plan, the, the success. 
Another way to answer your question might be is to hold those both things true. You got to be such an effective business person. See, you can be a late, you could be a less experienced business person and be successful if you're just ruthless and, and right. just turn over and, and take advantage of people and you can make your net. Now, if you're a real mad skilled business person, then you understand better than most what will sell and what won't sell and how to provide good customer service and how to market, oh my gosh, how to market like a madman, you kind of got that. Um, then I have extra money and time to do both. So kind of good business people kind of have to take advantage of people really super smart, good business people with great judgment and decision making can make money, grow, get respect, and take care of the people. And so, so to me, I don't know. I, 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 it, this is all easy to say. It's, it's, it's just tough to do. I don't know. What do you think? Um, what was the question? No, I'm kidding. Um, I think it is, I think it's like the most important thing to do. I think it maybe starts with a mindset thing and it starts with that sort of longer term view. Um, and I think it takes some confidence to have this longer term view and to really, right. really lean on this belief that like there's a universal law of reaping and sowing. So you don't plant a bunch of corn and think that you're going to get an orange grove. Like if you're planting corn, you're going to get corn. And so I think if you do the right things, whatever goodness you want is going to come. It might not come today. It might not come next year, but it's going to come at some point. And again, maybe this is just easier to say than to do, but if you can afford sort of quote unquote to have, to have that kind of longer term view, then you can be more patient with people. Then you don't bring that sort of anxiety into every single discussion. And you know, we talked about this a little bit, like if you see a mosaic, on the wall, you know, a big mural and it's a mosaic and it's a million, a million different tiles. Not every tile is going to be perfect. Some are going to yeah. be misshapen and some are, some are going to be miscolored. But when you step back, you can see this, this beautiful picture. I think when you have that longer term view and you're not so myopic zoomed in yeah. on just this little thing, then there's room for those tiles to be mistaken, mis misshapen or whatever. And I think if you can bring that to your team and let them see that, like, listen, you hit one out of three pitches, yeah. you're, you're a hall of famer. Like yeah. you're not going to get them all right. And you can kind of hold things a little, a little bit more loosely. And then you can sort of start to, you know, I, I think take yourself a little less seriously. Cause I don't think even these, like, you know, these people with these massive egos who you can't even tell them anything is wrong. Like if you had just an intellectually honest conversation with them and you said, you don't think you're perfect, right? They would say, no, of course I'm not perfect. But like, yet they act that way. I mean, the other side of that is like, okay, well then if you're not perfect, then you're wrong sometimes. And if you're wrong sometimes, then you might be wrong this time. And you need to bring some intellectual honesty to this debate or to this thing to say, hey, maybe I haven't considered this thing or this other thing. And maybe that's kind of rooted in that critical thinking stuff you were talking about. Um, but I just think, I think it's kind of a mindset. You know, I guess if I could boil down everything I just said, I think it's a mindset thing and it's a, it's a yep. timeline perspective. Like, you know, what game are you playing? Are you trying to win this particular at bat? Or are you trying to win the nine inning game? You know, the, the, the one thing I would emphasize is that if you want to be um, considered that person who really puts the people up there along with, I got to keep the company running. Uh, you just got to have mad business skills. Here's a, here's something I didn't tell too many people as I went along the way, <laughs> uh, is I, I kind of consider myself a benevolent dictator, which is not, I don't advise people to say that. I don't advise people uh, to, to, to do it that way. It has very negative convert connotations. By the way, I told, I told one person this who didn't particularly care for, I didn't do all the stuff she wanted me to do. It wasn't an employee. And she said, well, you got the dictator part right. And, <laughs> Uh, so basically what I mean by that is I would say, okay, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. Okay. Enough with the talking. Here's where we're going. If everybody can't, every, if you have 25 people on staff and every, and you say everybody can decide where we're going, you're screwed. Right. 
you got to go one way. Eventually, whether you people want to admit it or not, but good leaders have to be a bit of a dictator and say, we, we all have to go, generally speaking, in one direction. We have to have one mission and, and so on and so forth. And I have to make tough calls. Here, here's what I also tell the people at the end of the year. When we had a big net and we contributed to the reserve and we grew member-wise or count-wise, numbers went up, reputation went up, uh, we accomplished a lot of cool stuff. I would Once a year, uh, per, pretty much, I would tell them, okay, now you remember all that stuff that we had to do throughout the year that I didn't agree, you didn't agree with or that made you mad or I wouldn't take that idea or we had to do things a certain way. This is what it's all about because now you feel good. You have, you have, you have increased your reputation. You have increased the reserve. You've increased the growth. You, you, you're proud of what you've done. You're a respected organization. Try and remember this throughout the course of the year when things don't necessarily go your way. And so that's, that's kind of how I, I tried to listen to everybody, take care of the people, but not to the, to, to the degree where I agreed with so much that we ended up all losing our jobs because the company went under. Yeah, and I think that's, that's an important piece to sort of close that feedback loop and just remind people that, hey, you know, we had a tough year or whatever, or we had a bunch of debate this year and everything that you wanted probably didn't happen, but we still won the game, right? Like, you, not every time you line up for the snap is yeah. every guy agreeing with yes. the play that's being called, but you can still win the game in spite of that. People fail, you know, the, the, the guy didn't make the block and, and this quarterback got hurt and that guy feels terrible. And what you, and people screw up throughout the course of the year, usually smaller things. And you got to let all that go. Right. You know, you, you got to, we win the game. I, I'll tell you a funny uh, story. Uh, so we would play soccer. The girls, the, we have four girls, and they played soccer when they were really young. And they, um, oh my gosh, parents, sports parents are just crazy. And they would just scream, you know, to a handful of them, not all. Mm, right. And, and kick the ball, kick the ball, kick the ball, pass the ball, screaming. And, and I finally, I just yelled out to the world, win the game. And it, it was kind of like, let's get to the point here. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I just what are you doing here? How stupid it was to, to, to yell at them to kick the ball. I don't know. Yeah, it, I, uh, there was a, a, a boxing uh, match a couple of months ago. And, you know, they show the guys in the corner. And, uh, you know, you can hear how they're pep talking the guy. <laughs> and the coach was telling this, this poor guy who was just getting, like, pummeled. He's like, knock him out, man. Just knock him out. It's, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. It's like an insane thing. Of course he's trying to knock him out. He's trying to win the fight. Um, I love that. I love that. I love that picture. Just win the game. Um, I wanted to ask you this question. So we're all – we are all uh, subject to these biases and these cognitive, uh, these cognitive errors, right? That's our like natural state, right? We have this confirmation bias. We have these different things. And these are all, you know, I think you, I think one of your Royisms was like confirmation bias is kryptonite to integrity or something, right? Exactly. Thank you. Oh. It's my favorite one. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, I like that one too. So what do we do? So, I mean, you know, maybe I'm answering the, my, my own question. Like, where is our line for, like, responsibility against these biases? And how do we, with certainty or high certainty or high enough certainty, uh, battle against them in the decision-making process, whether it's an integrity-based one or it's just a problem-solving one? Okay, so there's a guy named Charles Lord. I think I got his name right. I, I, I referred to a few researchers throughout the book, but this one researcher had a control group where he told nothing to, and then had him look at uh, abortion. And they would looked at the research and the people who were pro-abortion uh, just found what they wanted to find. And people were anti-abortion and said, all this same research proves my point, which can't be right. You know, it's all the research they were shown proves the complete opposite that is the ultimate epitome of confirmation bias. 
And so then he did another one where he told one group nothing, the same thing really. And then he told another group, here's what biases are, don't have them. Here's what confirmation bias is, don't do this. They had them do, do it again and they all uh, still did the same thing. In other words, being aware of bias, sadly, which is what I'd li I'd like the answer to be that easy. You just read my book, read chapter whatever, <laughs> right. on bias, and your life will be good. Well, that it turns out that's nonsense. And again, I'm trying to take it from the the babblers who get up at a podium and say, "Don't be biased," and and didn't bother to study integrity enough to know that 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 does that that has been proven not to work. Then what he did was he said, decide what you want, against, against abortion, for abortion, and then study the opposite, consider the opposite. Um, prove yourself wrong. And then that's when people were able to overcome bias. Uh, people who do investigations, Jerry Zach told me about this, but he's he's a bias expert. I interviewed him for that chapter. He does a lot of presentations and education on bias. He's a certified fraud examiner. He knows how to investigate. Good investigators do this. They come to their conclusion, and before and before and before they tell their answer, they they go and say, "Okay, now I'm going to do my best to prove myself wrong." Right. Another way to look at it, this is the way I looked at it, is how could I fail it? How could I embarrass myself? I'm about to go forward with something, whatever it is. I don't want to be wrong. I'm going to go try and prove myself wrong, say all the things that other people are going to say about what I'm about to do so that I correct for that mistake and come forward with a better plan. But the, 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 you gotta, you gotta doubt yourself. You gotta disprove yourself. If you go through that exercise, the answer you come up with will be solid. Right. So Charles Lord proved that considering the opposite, come to your answer, try and prove yourself wrong, is the only way he could get a, a, sa a sample group of people to overcome bias. It's a, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, well, what other reasonable explanations could there be? And then you kind of run down that path and say, well, like, that's actually not reasonable because of X, Y, or Z and, yeah. and so forth. And you can start to, sort of start cutting those things away. Um, I think another kind of tool that can help with this kind of bias thing is kind of a way to fight against this binary thinking that we have. We think something is definitely this or it's definitely that, right? And I read this book called Thinking in Bets, and it really helped to underscore this sort of expected value type of thinking. And so just forcing someone to say, like, what are the odds, you know, how certain are you that you're right? Kind of put some kind of a confidence interval around something. Right. I mean, when are you actually 100%? There's like maybe two things that you can be 100% about. Most of the other things are some varying degree, and you're saying, you know, I'm kind of 80% on this, and that's fine. That's just how, how kind of life works. But incorporating that type of thinking, I think, helps us just – it's another kind of tool to fight against these biases before we just jump to this conclusion and just move on to the next thing, which I think we all have some tendency to do at some level. It's oddly connected to confidence. The more confidence that you might have, the more willing you are to doubt yourself, you know, to, right. to, to say, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with who I am. Uh, I'm okay with being wrong. I'm going to go forward to this business action or this decision or this whatever, and I'm going to play devil's advocate on myself. Actually, uh, <laughs> uh, another way to do this is to have, I'm going to coin a phrase stolen from some paper I heard about from Richard Bistrong from Harvard. I'm a, they didn't use this word, but that's where I got the idea. Integrity partner. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so in, in, let's say you're about to do something and maybe you there isn't a lot of good available data or there isn't a good way to test your hypothesis or question yourself to make sure you're not, you, you know, that you've overcome your bias and you're as right as right can be, is I just love calling experts. It's a part of critical thinking. Critical thinking is simply gathering facts and checking with experts. Um, you got to know what an expert is, by the way, and it's pretty simple definition. Somebody has done 
for 20 or 30 years what you're about to do for the first time. And I would, I would inevitably, you know, luckily because I had so many contacts being a part of a 20,000 member professional association and have 18 rocket science board members, I often didn't have to go past the board. I would just call a board member. You do this for 20 years. I'm about to do this. What could I go wrong? And quite often, uh, due to personality, my personality, whatever, they, they would just say, well, just tweak this one thing and it'll go over a little better, right? You know, don't. Soften this up or say this this way or something. Yes. Yeah, you're generally okay here, but if you present this better or if you just leave this one piece out, it really isn't consequential. Uh, there, there are times when they would just say you're barking up the wrong tree, you know, don't, don't do it. But more often your integrity, so I would have integrity advisors, not one, but an integrity advisor to every aspect of your life. And somebody's gonna fill three or four uh, aspects of your life, but the more, this is why networking is so important. Right. LinkedIn, go crazy on LinkedIn. Build your network, study your people, read their posts, Pit, join a professional association, go to conferences, build your network because I, I got taught this. I dedicated the first book in part to my mentor, Mark Dutman, who I was a compliance officer. I worked for him at Mayo and then he went to the University of Wisconsin. I followed him there to be his compliance officer. He, he, would, he would get his act together about making a big decision. Then he would call somebody up who did what he's about to do 20 times as opposed to what he had done never. Right. And he'd say, okay, I know what I'm talking about enough to ask you this question, but I have no idea whether I'm right. So you've done it 20 times or you've done it 20 years how what what would you do or what did you do it was just, it's so cheap it's so easy and people rarely do it man i don't know how much i wandered off from your binary thinking no, no this actually went right into the next thing i wanted to talk about i mean it's kind of this mentor piece it's kind of this account accountability partner thing it's kind of about really it's about decision making and there's no you know i like to say that there's uh no room with more group think in it than a room with one person in it. You know, <laughs> yourself of anything, you know what I mean? So just having to go to, you know, my, my brother's really good at this and we have a good sort of devil's advocacy culture. We might actually agree on something and he's good at hopping on the other side and just sort of taking the other sort why of- Why not? Yeah, why not? Why not beat it up and why not you're actually- You're gonna get it one way or not. You're gonna get it eventually. Practice, it, at a minimum, you're getting practice answering questions. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, I think that's exactly the point. And it, it, it lets you, again, it gets back to that, you know, okay, I can increase my confidence interval on whether this is a good decision by bouncing it off of you or bouncing it off of my brother or bouncing it off of some, es some expert who might ask a question that I hadn't thought of or no, you know, that's why you take your car to a mechanic before you buy it. Yep. They, they know what to look and they know kind of, you know, something that you probably don't know, but it's just, it's astounding how, to your point, how people don't, don't utilize this kind of free service that's part of their network. So, so it's, it would drive me insane. I would have employees who I'd say, why didn't you call an expert? You're doing this for the first time. I'm being, you know, the response would be, I'm being paid to do this. I'm being paid to think. I'm, this is my responsibility. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you, that's the, some wonderful stuff applied to the right thing to have all that sense of responsibility. But to exclude consulting others because you feel that you'll be like cheating. So another way to describe it is, if you go to somebody and say, you know, should you go to a foot doctor for brain surgery? They go, no. And, or, or you're, you're about to um, invest $100,000. Should you talk to anybody? I'm not thinking of it. There's certain things where people say, of course I would check with an expert. And then particularly in business, right? they're about to do some product for the first time or project or system or buy a piece of software and they will consult no one. And you go to them and ask them why. And they, they've got this beautiful explanation for them. But for you, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Wrong answer. 
Yeah, and what do you think that's rooted in? Do you think it's it's an ego thing? Do you think it's a cultural all, thing? All that. Pick, pick your, they got it all, but generally, sadly, unfortunately, it's it, they mean well. <laughs> yeah, right. And and when, they when, might think it's, a, it's an integrity thing, maybe. Well, I can't they, use this guy's idea. You're paying me for these ideas or something. I don't know. It, it's, it, it's, it's a mean well, good person doing a relatively not so br good thing of not consulting experts. Uh, there, it's like we get into this thing right now and it gets back to why I wrote the book, politics and social issues. We've lost our minds. We're not gathering facts. We got too many opinions. We're, 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 we're confirmation bias where I just go get an article to prove my, a selective search. Right. You know, why is it good to have this thing and not a general search into the pros and cons? Uh, People don't have a healthy respect for fact gathering and expert opinion. And it's, it, what's, it, here's the good news, man. Because so few people do that, if, if you've got that respect for expert opinion, get a network call the right person with all the experience, get fa check facts, do things like play devil's advocate. If you've got that stuff, you're going to pick a business, pick an industry. You're going to crush it because so many people you're competing against don't do it. You're going to be able to get all the market share you want. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a huge point. And I think it also works, you know, it works on that macro level if you're running a company or you're trying to get into a new in industry. And it also works at the micro level. If you're just running a small team or you have five people beneath you uh, that you're, you know, that you're overseeing just to ask those questions. And I think what it ends up doing, I think it ends up doing a couple of things. One, it lets you accelerate and differentiate. It allows you to get better ideas into your world. And it also, to the extent that, that you're able to present that process to the rest of your team, it lowers the sort of ego of the entire team and allows that, that idea of meritocracy to start to fill in there. So then that team can be sort of this, you know, perpetual motion machine of better ideas. I'll tell you what, don't make the mistake I did. I, I didn't have this very conversation with my staff clearly enough, often enough. I should have pulled everybody together. Uh, I hated meetings. I only I only did about a dozen meetings. I mean, I, I don't know, a couple meetings a year. They would pull people together for some event, and I would say a few words beforehand. But I would have called an all-staff meeting had I had my head on straight and told them that we're not the idea people. We're the go find the ideas, or we're not we're not the process people. We're about to go find the best process people. We're smart. We're good, but. Our job here is to go get the expert ideas. I want to get back to this critical thinking. I put a whole chapter on it, and I did eight video interviews. The first one was just released with a company called Compliance Wave, a guy named Joel Rogers. And he, he's a, he was, I interviewed him for the chapter on being genuine because he's such an honest, genuine individual. What you see is what you get there. Very much like yourself, sir, and it, and it's something you should be proud of. But this, he he literally put a question mark on the chapter of critical thinking. Why is this in a book on integrity? And I love Joel to death, but it was a head slapper, a knee, a, a forehead smacker. Yeah, yeah. Situation. I said, think about it. If you don't do critical thinking, if you don't talk to experts, if you don't gather all the facts, you're going to say something wrong. Now, you may think I just made a mistake, but people looking on said, you didn't tell the truth. You don't have integrity. What you told me and what I based an action or a decision, I then went on to have, and I told other people this thing that was, you screwed me. You don't have integrity. Of course, you've got to do critical thinking. You have to make sure what you're saying is true. You've got to ask the experts, you got to search for the facts. Maybe do that a little bit. Devil's advocate thing. I, I, you know, I've got that in the bias chapter, not in the critical thinking chapter. 
but it critical thinking is essential right. for integrity. And and here it is. I should not be surprised, right? I wrote a book about a gooey subject that everybody else does from podium preaching and finger pointing and fables. Mm -hmm. So I write one that's just the opposite. Practical, actionable steps, lesson plans, stuff like that, albeit a small book, it, it, it's somewhat helpful to this very big complex thing. And of course people are gonna look at it and go, well, that's not how to do it. We've always done it this way. And I'm like, well, whatever you've done in the past, I'm sorry, it's not working. Settlements and major corporations are off the, the biggest they've ever been. I personally believe our cultural integrity with regard to politics and social issues couldn't be more in the toilet. Right. Phrase I wouldn't have used prior to retirement, probably. <laughs> but you're getting the unfettered. Reading. We're seeing the real road. <laughs> People should fear this. I, I have a little bit of hesitancy to say what I really think for a number of reasons, one of which people are still going to always associate me with SCCE, and I never want to hurt them. But uh, it, there, is, there is greater risk of me saying stuff that could be problematic because, like I said, if you, if you want to be true to yourself, if you want to uh, have solid integrity. A, a key thing is, is you got to let go from what people want you to say. I mean, be civil, be a good, one more thing about that, by the way, whenever I write about, th there's a chapter on civil debate and, and telling, I want people to understand how to do it well. I, I tell people, be genuine, be yourself. And they say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Everybody tells me I'm a jerk. They'll do the post. I've done a few posts on, on being truthful and all this sort of thing. And, well, oh, thank you, Roy, for confirming that I'm okay because everybody tells me I'm a jerk. And I said, no, 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 no. Don't use my thing here about telling the truth as an excuse to be a jerk. I didn't say, and oh, it's okay to be a jerk. Right. Um, you can be truthful, which I hope to be in my retirement, more truthful, and but but still be civil about it. And by the way, have you studied civil debate uh, much? Uh, there, there's, I haven't, no. There, there's, there's some stuff you got to look. Have you ever heard of the, this is another thing I shouldn't bring up because it's just going to alienate people, but have you ever heard of a thing called the, the intellectual dark web? Uh, I think I have. This is basically, it's basically the confirmation bias web. It's, it could be. It, I, I think I heard a little bit about that. But basically, there's some people like Eric Weinstein. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher his name. Uh, uh, Sam Harris. Jordan Peterson. Yes. They're, they're people from all different political and social views. Democrats, Republicans, this is a mistake people make. They, they think it's one side or the other, and whatever side you think they're on, then you hate them. Don't, right. don't do that. I saw seven of them up, up on the panel, and, and, and they've been told that they were one side or the other, and uh, they, they think they're all Republicans, and they hate them. And, and, and Weinstein, it's Eric and his brother were on this panel, and they said, we're both Democrats. And, and, and I believe it was Eric coined the phrase intellectual dark web. Please, if anybody goes in to study these people, please set aside your politics and your social issues for a moment and watch just one thing, how they debate. If you, and by the way, why is civil debate an important part of integrity? Truth and honesty are probably the only two morals or values or principles that I would agree to that have to be on your list of, of integrity, to have integrity. There's no compromising. And if you want to get to the truth, you have to debate, you have to discuss, you have to learn. And these guys do it better than anybody at a time when everybody's shouting each other down.
Yeah, we're we're in this realm where, to your point, if uh, the the tweet is from a Democrat and uh, you're a Republican, or if it's tweets from a Republican and you're a Democrat. They could be saying the most basic thing that the tree is green or the sky is blue, and you and you. are gonna get crushed. Yeah, you you must agree or you or you must disagree or you're not a real Republican or you're not a real Democrat. And I know some of those names that you talked about, and I understand what you, what you're talking about. Uh, a lot of those guys say things again. The idea should stand on its own, regardless of who's saying it. The truth of the statement is gonna be true or not, depending on irrespective of who says it, right? Hate, hate, hate the idea. Don't hate the person or the debate or their attempt to try and describe why they think the way they do. Uh, disagree with capital punishment if you want or agree with it. But embrace the civil debate of it. And if there, there is a video of Sam Harris and Joel, jo Jordan Peterson, and they did a three hour debate with the moderator. And the first thing they did was Jordan described Sam's views on religion and said, Sam, or said, Joel said, Sam, I'm gonna describe to you your position before we stick debate, so you know I have listened. And then you correct me until I get it right. When Jordan was d done describing Sam's position, which Jordan was about 180 degrees in disagreement with, right. Sam said, you could write my next book. Right. Then Sam described Jordan's position on religion. And Jordan said, "Got no I've got nothing. You, that's close enough. And then they debated a, a polarizing issue for three hours civilly and beautifully. If you dislike this thing you just described about a tweet made by a person who's in a group that everything they say you hate and disagree with, regardless of the, don't study, don't, don't, don't do any critical thing, don't fact check, don't do nothing, just hate it, disagree with it, because they're a part of a group you don't like. If you don't like that, Go find the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris debates. It was the first one they did. It was about three hours long and watch the first part of it is all you got to do. And now you're not just talking about this, by the way, the, the, the vague crowd would just say, listen, you should listen. The, the guys who are, are more into prove it is do what they did. Prove you listen. Right. Describe their position. Yeah, and you can't do that unless you actually understand the position. And so listening, understand. I can sit through a podcast or I can sit sit through a thing and all the words are sort of flowing into my ears. That's technically listening. But until you can articulate it back without logical fallacies and ad hominem attacks, which is what <laughs> do, then you don't really understand it. And you know, frankly, Look, Jordan Peterson did not think he was going to convince him of the other position, nor yeah. did the, uh, the other guy think he was going to convince Jor Jordan Peterson to come on his side. But the point is, that forum, which, it, which is an actually a very interesting debate, uh, was really about exploring these well-articulated positions uh, that, again, were not sort of you know, head-in-the-sand positions. They were, they were positions in the context of these other other arguments to better understand the sort of the facets and the shapes of those those positions, which we like don't have any time for. We're flipping through our feed. We're looking for a tweet. We're getting that that uh, that you know that dopamine drip in our brain from something that really resonates with us, and we're flipping past the things that create that dissonance for our position because we always we all have this kind of internal desire to remain to be sort of like logically consistent or something like like that but it ends up just feeding us into these these logical sort of fallacy areas that there's no room for that civil debate which is a extremely destructive so so uh something that people really should hang on to that you said is they're not probably going to change their position people make gigantic changes 180 degree flips but it's not it's super rare what happens during civil civil debate is that jordan or sam 
on polar opposite positions will make a point. The other person will beat it up. And Jordan will say, ah, oh, you're right. I didn't explain that right. Let me, let me make my case better. So they, and sometimes, you know, your position, albeit 180 degrees different, is made up of a whole bunch of smaller elements. Right. And you may give up a piece of your position, may not give up the, the, the primary position, but you give up a, oh, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't say that. That's wrong to say. Or I should say it better. I believe it still, even though you disagree with me, but I see how the way I describe, you know, th these guys are getting smarter. They're getting to the truth. Men and women and of, the, of the intellectual dark web, which once again, if you go look at this and you read about it, political fanatics have made it political. Political, and it's not. Uh, I mean, they do discuss politics, I'm sure, but th they're... The intellectual dark web is the antithesis to what's happening on social media and this hate and polarized environment. If you hate what's going on, go study these guys. I actually had it in the book, but it got pulled out because, well, wait a minute. I don't, I don't think I ever said the words. I can't remember. I, the book got edited a lot, and they, they, they kind of thought that this would be upsetting to people to talk about, which is kind of a which shame. Is interesting. But it's, it's also interesting, and it also speaks to this sort of culture that we're in right now, where just if you and I disagree on a particular issue or a particular social perspective or something, yeah. then I must be a really bad person. I, I, it's, a bizarre, it's, a, it's a bizarre view. I, I wrote this book with a woman named Karen Kenny, who has edited 200 books and written 200 books roughly. She is a genius. She, she saved me, li literally. But uh, uh, we are all in great risk of me writing another book, because if I do now that I don't work there, it won't be with Karen, probably. I suppose I could subcontract her with, with her, but if I ever wrote a book without a guiding person like that, I could be in, God help us all, we're, we're in trouble because I would not leave out stuff that will make people mad. Maybe that's um, what the world needs, Roy. Maybe <laughs> now's the time to unleash you for real. <laughs> You know I what? You get a numb to plume and you write whatever you want. I could, I could. And uh, I still wouldn't do it without a good book editor, but it would be absolutely a treat to, to say, you know, look, this time I, I will listen all I can. I will read, you know, she made me fact check and research. There's a lot of incredible value, but there's going to be some stuff we're going to, I'm going to put in the book that you're not going to like. And you're going to tell me it's going to make people mad and then uh, yeah. I have to leave it in. Yeah. And it's just, it's too bad that that's kind of where, where we're at. I don't know if there's been other points in uh, recorded history where it's been like this. I, j I just don't know. I think I have this like romantic view of like ancient Greece where guys would just kind of like sit around under a tree and just sort of just debate and so forth. But there, this, it, this can't be the first time that it's that, that, that this level of sort of this, you know, it gets okay. so visceral or something. I don't know. I got, I got to tell you about the age of reason. You know what? You've heard of the age of reason? Okay. So I'm, I'm buzzing along in this book and I go, you know what I'm advocating for? Sounds like something I heard of called the age of reason. That's all I knew about it. The three words, age of reason. I went and looked it up. You know, I, 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 I read the definition simply for a hundred year period, you weren't thrown in jail for saying the earth was round, or I think the earth revolves around the sun as opposed to the other way. It was a hundred year period where we essentially had civil debate and unbelievable mathematical, astronomical, uh, and many other fields of, 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 of industry or thought or study where, where there was huge advancements. Right. Age of reason, all it was, was all this crap we got right now was shut down. Right. And sort of and, the opposite of what we're living in now, you're saying. 
So I, I think you're right to say that have a, a little bit of a Pollyannish view. Now there, there are horrible periods of age of, I, I call the period we're in right now, the age of unreason. Right. There, we're, we've always been in a state of flux. The pendulum swings back and forth. My belief is that this thing that I really wrote the book about is this age of unreason and please using integrity, let's get out of it. In, it is, is uh, I think the pendulum on its way back. I think this will lead to uh, a second age of reason. And I say that a little tongue in cheek because I obviously don't know the future. I, I, I'm only guessing, but I, I think we're gonna come to our senses here and we're gonna look at all these college campuses with shutting speakers down and, and telling people they can't talk. Of all the places I in know. the world. And, and, uh, and some, somehow it's gonna be a head smack a moment for everybody where we go back to uh, civil debate. Yeah, that's a whole, I mean, maybe that's a whole podcast about this topic because, you know, this place, college, uh, where ideas are supposed to form and they're supposed to be, you know, the home of civil debate and the, the exploration of different perspectives and so forth. To your point, this pendulum has swung to such a, to such a degree where you can't say certain things and, you know, it's just, uh, it's an insane, it's an insane. Let me be wrong. Let me be wrong. Let me say something that you with more experience say, well, that's, that, that you're, you're close, Roy, but you, you, you don't know this fact. Add this fact in, change what you said just a little bit. You're not undoing everything, and now you're going to be smarter. It, it, it's like this. If, if we sit here and just poo-poo everything somebody else says because they're not in my group, it's hard to get better. I say I have an experience and a thought and idea that's right. You have an idea that a thought and experience is is right. There, that I don't have and you don't have mine. We both say them. And then we say, if what you said, Roy, is true, and if what I, Nick, said is true, then this third thing is true that neither one of us thought of. That's right. when one and one makes three. That's when uh, intellect advances. And for that to have happened, yes, you, you can't have this shut down all thought that disagrees with my mentality. You got to have a civil debate. There's an actual conversation there and there's an actual consideration of your perspective and my perspective and how these pieces of iron can sharpen each other. I, I, I get smarter by debating you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I disagree. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask you this. So the whole point of this podcast at large is to, you know, this thing that I saw when, when we got into this game was these functions that, that we serve and that we're a part of, I think are these massively underutilized assets in, in organizations. I think that there's a lot of backward thinking, a lot of sort of 1900 style mentalities at the folks at, at the top who, you know, getting back to that sort of, when's my payoff for this thing? And we got to hit our quarterly numbers. That's kind of a caricature of what I'm talking about, but it's about yeah. need for a direct tie between the dollars I spend on ethics and compliance and the bottom line return that I'm looking for. So yeah. these folks end up getting viewed as cost centers. They end up getting declawed. They end up sort of getting jammed into these pigeonholes and they're not able to like be unleashed. So part of what we're trying to do is help break that, that mentality to elevate these functions and turn some of those light bulbs on at the top so that those people can make the impacts to the organizations that we're talking about, right? Like if you can have an a truly, uh, a, you know, an authentic culture that's based on true integrity where people feel they can be their authentic selves and you're going to get all this goodness that we've been talking about for, 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 for the last little while. How do we break out of that old mold? How do we help the people listening to this really go to that next level and stop being viewed as a cost center, which, you know, whatever that means. It got, it, 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 as um, we talked about earlier, it's got to, to be the change at the top. The motivators for the decision makers, the leaders, has to change. It has to change from quarter to quarter share price dividends to something else. And it's happening. Mm -hmm. Have you, do you know Allison T Taylor? Yeah, she was just on this a couple of weeks ago. Ah, fantastic. So this ties in a lot to her. Of what she's up to. She's corporate social responsibility 
and, and more. Uh, she's done a lot of thinking about compliance and ethics too, but it's just, it's a little, it's kind of like beyond compliance. I hate that phrase to be honest with you because you can't go beyond compliance till you stop breaking the law. Right. Um, so first things first, but uh, I've been watching some of that and, and investors are now starting to say to companies, portfolio manager, head fund people are starting to say, we are going to, uh, our, our portfolio over the next few years is going to change to companies who focus on things like this, people, compliance, ethics, integrity, uh, social issues, these sorts of things. Green company. And I can't remember the guy's name, but there's a guy who writes a letter every year to all the CEOs. He's one of the biggest fund managers there is. And he wrote one recently that basically said, it's time. Corporate social responsibility, ethics, integrity, these sorts of things. We, we, all those things are going to be now a factor. And then about a hundred CEOs, there's some group called the CEO group or it's not the name. Yeah, yeah. But they they all said we're going to start focusing on this. Now, I believe the fund manager, I have yet to see action from the CEOs. I think it's easy to say we're going to care. But you know, uh look, the, the any compliance professional out there wants to have more support from leadership's got to earn it. They have to communicate with leadership the benefits and advantages of what you're talking, what what we're talking about. Compliance and ethics programs. They've got to teach them we're not a cost center, we're a revenue retention center. You're, we're a respect retention center. And, and then maybe go to them with this letter from this fund manager, I, I wish I could remember what the name of the, this guy's name is, but it, it, and it, you've, you've got to spend more time with leadership on the big picture stuff and, and educate them. And, you know, uh, there's some stuff in the book that I would slip in in your training, board training, C-suite training, they're all going to give you 10, 15 minutes a year or whatever it is you're going to get, never enough. But, you know, say, here's something that I think we need to teach all the employees. A little more fundamentals about critical thinking so they make better decisions, not just for business, but for ethics and integrity and, and compliance. So it's, uh, it's a battle. I, I, I hope we keep fighting it. I hope we get better at it. I hope I, th I think I think as be businesses become more efficient, more automated, uh, uh, th there's going to be more money and more time for those to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to take some of these efficiencies that we built into our organizations and save money. I'm going to invest it in these things because I think this is going to become more and more important to people. Compliance with the rule of law, not showing up on the front page and of the newspaper, ethics, not having a, 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 a failure of, of integrity, um, and then corporate social responsibility and the things that Allison is interested in, uh, being greener and, and these sorts of things. Um, I, I, think, I think all the, all the signs point to this being a long, slow slog over the next 20 years. I got to tell you, 25 years ago when I started in this business, they had no idea what a compliance officer and a compliance program was. Right. We've come a long way. And for those of us who have been in it since the beginning, it's, we've, we've, it's frustrating because it hasn't come very far in, in a way. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's because uh, it ain't it ain't to the top of the mountain yet, so to speak. It's incremental. It's such small improvement, but you just don't give up. 
you know, you just keep going, you keep slogging away. If what you're working on is right for the world, following the rule of law, having integrity, behaving ethically, are you kidding me? This all makes total sense. How you get there, how much resource you, do, you know, how relevant can you become to leadership? And there's this new thing. So I think that's a phenomenal answer. I think I agree with pretty much all of it. Um, I would say, so the way I kind of look at it is, like, think about when the internet first came out. Uh, <laughs> like, guys were like, you know, this, I mean, you had, uh, you had economists, New York Times economists, well-known economists saying, this is going to do nothing more than just like replace the fax machine. Okay, fast forward now, it's obviously part of everybody's go-to-market strategy. It's part of their identity. It's how they do business on every single level. But there was, when, when that fax machine discussion was going on, the board was thinking, you know, what is this? This is stupid. We need a website. I don't even know what a server is, right? So at some point, those light bulbs went on. At some point, the critical, you know, that, that tipping point was hit. And, you know, it, you know it, what do they say? It happens, you know, an overnight success takes 20 years and then it happens overnight or it happens little by little and then all, all at once. That same thing ha ha happened, that happened in IT. I think we're going to see it over this next decade in the HR and in the ethics and compliance. Wonderful, wonderful metaphor. Let me tell you a funny little story just to prove your point. So I was in college. I had a Hort degree. I had a two-year degree and a four-year degree and two and a half years of experience working in some pretty amazing greenhouses. And for the fun of it, I took six Fortran and basic programming languages. They were my electives. It turns out the six programming classes in 1980 sold for more than the two degrees and two and a half years of, of experience in quality greenhouses. And I went to work for the University of Wisconsin. Ironically, I worked there twice, two different, well, totally different industries. And I was considered a unicorn and a genius and a rare deal because I understood microcomputers. Actually, not till I got there. That's what they had me work on. So 1980, 82, I developed this expertise, very short, but nobody had it. So it was really valuable. And I eventually got to work at Mayo Clinic. I think it was maybe 84, 85. And I went to work in the IT department as the first microcomputer programmer to ever work there. And uh, I mean, to be hired for that reason. There was another guy I worked for that was doing some stuff in it. They had 50 IBM PCs at the time. And the big IT guys who were my friends, I liked the people, we worked together well, but they told me, that's a toy, get it out of here. <laughs> Okay, you cannot put computing in the hands of the end user. And they were right and they were totally wrong. They were right from their perspectives. They wrote an assembler, COBOL, languages the average person couldn't write in. What they were wrong about is they hadn't taken the time or they'd done the critical thinking to gather the facts and watch a spreadsheet work a word processor work or a database manager work. And I didn't think to show them. They didn't think to look at it. I just went around and helped a few people who had a PC who were going, holy cow, this is amazing. And then eventually the genius, the, the, you know, the very experienced knew much more than I, IT guys, saw the spreadsheet database and word processor and said, Oh my gosh, everything's going to change. And my biggest critic, who was a friend of mine, asked for a job in our department. He went from, get this crap out of here. Can I, can I work for you in a year? The bell went off. Okay, that was a little quicker. It took years from there for everybody to have a computer and the internet. But you're right. So I said to myself, to tie this all into a loop, I, I walked away, I, I got a job in administration, it was cool, uh, it was a big mistake, because if I stayed in the microcomputer industry, I'd have been retired by now. And with the, the early start and expertise and all that crap. 
I said, if it ever happens to me again, if I ever see something coming where the experts, not just anybody, but the IT experts told me it was junk. If I ever get, get in something where I even think the experts are wrong and I'm sure I'm, I'm never, I'm never leaving. I'm going to jump to the middle of it. But I thought it's never going to, I'm not going to be this lucky to see this coming this early. Lo and behold, my boss makes me a compliance officer. I had no idea what it was. About six months in, I smacked my forehead. Said, this is going to be huge. It's happened. Nobody gets it. Everybody's telling me it's a joke. And I jumped into the middle of it, overshot my mark, you know, with the SECE. What a piece of luck that was. But when I first started out, the experts, who were the experts? The legal community. What did the legal community think of compliance? Looking, rummaging around for problems, turning over rocks, reporting problems to leadership. They thought this was not only junk and never going anywhere, but it was harmful to the organization. And frankly, many still do. Well, 25 years later, billions, I don't know, a billion, hundreds of millions, it's gotta be billions, is being spent on this. There, it, doesn't look, it doesn't look like there are any stopping it. It's it just so slow, it's frustrating. Yeah, it's so slow, but I think um, the line is not a straight line. It's not a linear type of a path. I think it's a parabolic path. And I think the reason why is because some of those light bulbs at the top are starting to go on because this fund manager is writing it because these studies come out that show the ethical companies actually outperform and they actually yeah. move the needle on an indirect basis. The integration of an organization where the silos between marketing and accounting and ops and all this stuff, those things are starting to bleed out and, you know, fall away essentially. And the integrated nature of an organization I think is becoming more and more apparent. And what I think is going to really help it to accelerate is uh, again, COVID, pending depression, perhaps recession notwithstanding, is that as this generational shift takes place and as the millennials begin, become the largest sort of contributors to the economy, uh, the millennials who view, who have a different sort of hierarchy of values, so to speak, it's not just yeah. the almighty dollar, it's about these other things for a number of reasons, right? They come, they're well-educated more so than others. They come out with all this debt. They've seen two, uh, you know, economic crashes in their lives. All these other things that people used to sort of stand on as absolute truths are not true to this, to this whole group. There is a, that different priority set is feeding into consumption um, decisions. And now this line, uh, I, I had a recent conversation that, that was super interesting, but this line between sort of marketing, uh, external branding, and internal branding or employer branding is starting to, to bleed out to such a degree. There's so much more transparency with social. Uh, people are making decisions, especially now with the whole COVID thing, about brands based on how they treat their people. This sort of altruism and all this other stuff feeds into the decision-making at a much deeper level. And like I said earlier, we're gonna see a massive separation. And this, this whole thing may be the catalyst that really, really is the true tipping point for these positions to accelerate out and them not to be viewed as this cost center, but to say, you know what, if I throw a couple extra bucks to build our employer brand, our, the things I care about, our bottom line, our margins, whatever, are gonna increase because we're gonna be more efficient and we're not gonna have 20% turnover every year. And our people are gonna stay 15% longer than they normally would. All those other things that are obviously dollar-based things, we're obviously, you know, I love this term you said, revenue retention centers. I'm gonna spend more money on the revenue retention centers because my reputation, right, which is just the sum, you know, my brand is a reputation. The reputation is just the sum of all these activities within my organization. I'm never going to have an, I'm never going to have a company or a brand that my clients love if it's not full of people that love that, that company. So the people that are able then to affect that culture, people who are able to affect, you know, compliance, ethics, HR, who are able to drive those behaviors within the organization, those are the folks that, that need to be empowered. And now I'm not going to start cutting from those folks. Just like, I'm not going to say, you know what, we got to shut down our data center. Time, time to tight, tighten our belt. Let's shut down our website. Like no one's going to say that because that's an integral piece of the puzzle. It's an accelerant. And that's what I think these functions actually are. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the recession or depression or whatever happens affects the compliance world because they're going to have to be cutting and selective and we'll, we'll, we'll know in a 
year or two, there'll be some numbers that we'll, we'll be able to point to that. So but a couple of thoughts that I want to add to what you were saying is, A, it has to be affordable. You have to have the money and resources to be able to spend on this. And if you look at the efficiency gains from robotics, automation, mm -hmm. spreadsheets, database, uh, word processing, more, the world has become wildly more efficient. Mm -hmm. A company has more resources now. They don't need 10 people in accounting, they need one. They don't need 100, they need 10. Um, I'm not, you know, who knows what the numbers are, but the automation is, it has to have helped. So now we can afford to do this. The other thing you talked about is, is, uh, Transparency, I call it forced transparency, is a factor in all this. I have two words for you, Panama Papers. It, the hackers are now getting their excitement out of rummaging through data and disclosing it, not for profit, but for social issues. And so if everybody is starting to realize that nothing they say or do is safe anymore, then what they're going to say and do is more likely to be ethical and compliant than it would have been 10, 20 years ago. So it's fun. Who knows? It to debate the future the factors that will affect the future. Uh, I've just personally, I've been watching it for 24 years. I don't have any different view than I did the day it finally hit me what a compliance program was and a compliance officer did. It was about six months after I had the job. And I had the same thought that I did when I saw a microcomputer in 1980. This is going to be huge. I thought 24 years ago, when about, it was 95 or 6, I was made a compliance officer. This is going to be huge. I have been in the middle of it, dead square center pretty much, for 24 years. I've been told I'm right and I'm wrong. I've debated it with the best there is. I'd like to think I've been optimistic and playing devil's advocate and, and being responsible and not saying things that are hopeful and not true. Um, I think it's still going to be a part of every everyday life. It's going to get into places that it isn't in now. Uh, a, a great example of that, of where there'll be growth, nonprofits. For-profit companies have been the first to be asked to implement compliance program by the government. That's where the focus has been. But as we can see, there are nonprofit gigantic entities that have tr been operating on the basis of trust like no other organization because their mission is good. So everybody must be honest in our, all our employees must be honest. Well, they're finding out they're no different. And so now they're implementing mechanisms. Call them a compliance program, call them a doorknob. It's, it, it's auditing, monitoring, education, uh, policies and procedures. This, this is gonna be big. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that is the, that's, that's the next area for uh, the compliance explosion to come because there's so much, there's so much sort of compliance opportunity there and there's so much moral hazard potential there. The, 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 their risk is their trust. Trust but verify. Trust and trust, trust but don't, don't verify is, is a risk area. Right. And it, it's, it's beautiful. Some of these nonprofits are doing the greatest things for people in the world but they're, 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 they're at risk of poor behavior, maybe not as much as some other industries or types of organizations, but they're, it's, they're at they're, least they're right. failing left and right. They're in the newspaper for epic 
legal and ethics failures. So why aren't they looking for, why aren't they preventing, finding, and fixing ethical and regulatory problems with a compliance and ethics program and a compliance and ethics officer more often than they do? And, yeah. and, and all this will push down into smaller and smaller companies too. There's lots of room for growth. Um, last thing, I promise. Um, what is your, what are your thoughts on this whole whistleblower thing where you have the- oh, I, I, Don't ask me this question. <laughs> the answer is gonna be way too good, sir. All right, well, uh, at, at, at risk of overshadowing everything we've talked about for the last little while here, um, it's just an interesting thing for me because I think any, any whistleblower, assuming they're not like a tattletale, let's put that aside because that's kind of yeah. like a silly thing. It's coming from a place of like, I think, high integrity, right? It's like there's some dissonance between how things are supposed to go right. and how they're, how, what I'm seeing. And there's some ownership I feel as a whistleblower for the culture, for the business, for the bill of goods, so to speak, that I was sold. I'm going to speak up and do something about it and say some, some, something about it. And then these guys, in many cases, they end up kind of getting screwed. Okay. I, I'm a bit of a devil's advocate. I'm, I'm whistleblowing. We got to have, we have a hotline. We have to teach people about the hotline. We have to ask them to call the hotline. We need issues reported. Okay. But what's not being discussed is the abuse of the hotline. Let me give you a couple examples. When hotlines first emerged onto the scene, I believe it was the French and the Germans, two European countries said, not in our country. And my fellow colleagues in the compliance industry, industry blew a gasket and said, how can we do this? I'm a multinational, I can't have a hotline here and not there, and how could you not want disinformation? You must be bad people. No, they have a memory of what happened to people who blew the whistle in Germany and other countries as, as, as the Nazis went through Europe. People died as a result of whistleblowers. I, nobody, oh my gosh, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to jail now to, to relate those two terms. But essentially, what did people do? They called up, go look in this basement. Okay, is that a whistleblower? I don't know, you told on people. You want these people, here they are. I, it, it, you want this problem, here it is. It, it's, people are making phone calls to people to tell them, now it was for evil, it was for pure evil, but. But it was compliant. It, they, they, they said, you want these guys, here they are. You're telling me I gotta turn these over, you're gonna kill me, here they are. I don't know. I told you I was going to get in trouble. I am definitely going to jail now. But first <laughs> thing, I cannot be fired. Um, Very secure okay. position you're in, yeah. Here's another. So, 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 so everybody sat down and said, look, guys, I understand you got this problem. You have this history. You never want to go back there. But we got to have this. How are we going to be able to work it out? What are you really concerned about? They said, I'm concerned about protecting the accused, the falsely accused, and or the inappropriately accused or whatever, because that was what was stuck in their head. Mm -hmm. um, I would, I'm not really comparing them. That's what the French and Germans did. They compared I get it. The, this whistleblower thing to what happened uh, to Jewish folks during the war. Okay. And um, so if you're mad, call somebody else. <laughs> okay, so, so they said, well, what if we implemented controls to protect the falsely accused? And the French and the Germans said, okay, now they got hotlines. Um, I have been concerned about the falsely accused since day one. And secondly, I have been accused I've been concerned about the, those who don't make a strong enough effort to report it internally. There are people who walk down the hallway, grab some supervisor and say, I think there's a problem over there in this department. 
and the supervisor's running down the hall for some other thing, and they don't follow up properly. Then the individual goes to the government and says, give me my 33%. I told them, and they didn't act on it. Well, how hard did you try? Right. How, how, what kind of effort did you make? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to win any favors from people. They're going to criticize me. I'm sorry. That's not me. I'm going to die on my sword or whatever they say, uh, fighting internally to, to help my company that I'm loyal to fix the problem. I'm going to, if I get ignored, I'm going to go up a step. If I get ignored, I'm, especially if I'm a compliance officer, and then I'm going to end up at the audit committee of the board and say, if you don't listen to me, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to write you board members, every board member, a letter saying, here's the problem. And if you don't fix it, I'm leaving or no, I'm leaving. That's, that's actually the noisy exit step. The last step, hopefully where I get to keep my job is with the audit committee. If they don't rally around me, I write the letter to the board saying, this is my noisy exit. Here's why I left. You should look into this. And then I got to decide whether I'm going to report it externally. Okay. I'm that guy. I'm not the guy who makes one little conversation for three minutes and then goes. And there's a lot of that you, in, in your view of, you know, these, uh, these whistleblowers who end up getting blackballed because they go to report their company to the SEC or something like you're saying that if you're really loyal to your company and you're really a high integrity person, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to summarize the position. If you're really, if, if you're really a high integrity person and you're really willing to sort of, go to the government, then you should, you should have already exhausted every single sort of reasonable step within the, underneath the umbrella of your organization before you kind of yeah. talk about family business outside the family. Okay. So, so here's the, 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 the pr problem with my thinking is that there's some people who are, 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 are shy or, uh, they don't have financial resources or whatever. They're truly afraid and, and, and they, they quit sooner than I do for a reason that many would say is okay. Okay. I'm just saying what I would do mm -hmm. before I became a whistleblower. I believe it's a matter of integrity to my obligation to the people who are paying my salary and my benefits to go in and I'm going to fight to the death. The death will be my firing or my noisy exit with a letter to the board and out the door, whether I'm a compliance officer or not, that's where I would go. Then I walk out the door, I don't have my job anymore, then I decide what to do. And I tell you, if people are being physically armed, I'm going straight to the police, straight to the, to the government. Uh, I probably would have done that sooner had I been, I, I'm, I, I'm not gonna wait Physical harm, I, I'm not, I'm not going to wait a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's a different category to, is what you're saying. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah you got to work on this. Here, here's another thing I want to jump to. Okay, so all we hear about is how horrible companies are and how abused and retaliated against whistleblowers are. What we're not hearing is that there are companies, and I believe Navex releases a report every year studying hotline data. They provide hotlines. They see how many issues are resolved, either with the issue was reported and it turned out to be true, or it didn't turn out to be true. And I've checked it a couple of times. I can't believe it. People should check it. Don't, don't use this number. Go look up Navex's last report that's publicly available, I think it's like 50% end up to be incorrect. Do you know what happens to people who are accused falsely of a, an ethical or a re regulatory issue? In many cases, their career is destroyed. Their reputation within the organization is destroyed or publicly they are chastised before a single fact is gathered or a single person is interviewed. Yeah, it's a guilty, um, you know, Instantly. guilty first kind of type of thing, guilty before proven innocent. Okay. So here's the problem that I couldn't talk about until I was retired. 
till I could only harm my reputation and not someone else's, some other organization. I'm no longer employed, and I'm telling you somebody should start to speak out about the falsely accused. It's not happening. They are not protected. Given the data I have seen, it's entirely possible it's half the people. So what do you do? What do we do about that? Well, some fool, first of all, has to sound the alarm. No? Some fool has to come out with data. Grab data like Navex data and stand up in front of a big crowd. Get on Twitter. Get on in, uh, LinkedIn and say, there is this thing that we can't talk about because there is a, a group of people who will shout you down and trash your reputation if you say anything but every whistleblower is correct and retaliated against any other I'm, i am so going down if you do it do it and you are certainly welcome to do so sir <laughs> is this is the first time I've ever done this. Think about this crap has been on my mind for 24 years, roughly since wow. I was a compliance officer. And I'm only now speaking up. First of all, somebody has to sound the alarm, withstand the, the people who will say, there is nothing can be said except for all the whistleblowers are right and all whistleblowers are falsely retaliated against. No other message can get through. Someone has to stand up to all that, overcome all that, and get people to at least do critical thinking. Let's go gather some facts. Let's go interview some people. Let's go tell some stories, not about the whistleblowers retaliated against, about the individual whose career was trashed through an investigation and at the end, they were found out to be innocent. Unfortunately, they were tarnished for life. Anybody remember the fellow named Richard Jewell? Why do you think that Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood, couldn't remember his name for a moment, did, uh, did that movie? Clint Eastwood's got a little bit of my thinking in him. That yeah, I mean, guy was falsely accused, trashed by the unethical press before any facts were gathered. His life was ruined. Then they did a little research. There was a proper investigation and he's found out to be innocent. Am I missing something here? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and I, I, I wonder if it's trending worse because of like the cancel culture that we're in. in. In the book, I have a quote from Barack Obama saying the cancel culture is wrong. One of the first questions I got when I got interviewed about the book Aren't you concerned that you will alienate half of the population by quoting a politician? And I said, wouldn't it be ironic if I got canceled by half the people in this country <laughs> for quoting a politician saying the cancel culture is wrong? It's almost worth it, yeah. <laughs> no, sir, that's exactly what, it's not almost, it's why I left it in. I if I it. die on this hill, it was worth it. Yeah, it's like Very prove, it prove the point. It would prove the point of the insanity of it. Do you know what I mean? You know, there's a lot of insanity going on right now that we've touched on a lot today. And it's why I started this book. It's why I wrote this book. It turns out to be a gigantic can of worms. I wonder. I love talking to people like you because you make me think. Okay, so... I, I, in 1980, I stumbled in the microcomputer industry before everybody else, and I realized it was big, but I'm too young to realize I was more correct than the experts who worked in the ID department. I walked away from that industry. Five years later, I realized the error of my ways. It was too late, maybe. 
and I just wandered off. I said, if I'd ever come back, maybe if I ever see it again, I will not wander off. I'll go to the center. Compliance came along. All the lawyers told me it was garbage. I ignored them and went to the center and created what is now an internationally of, uh, effective organization at helping people prevent, find, and fix ethical and regulatory problems. What if there is a third thing in my life that I have discovered and decided to, I think it's going to be big. I'm there early and mm-hmm. that if I go to the center, I can have some fun or money. I just don't really, I'm not going to seek the money. But if I do, don't call me a bad guy. <laughs> um, is what if, a small group of people realized the horrors of some of the stuff we've been talking about mm-hmm. and jump out in front. The difference being that the first guys are going to die on, on the hill. Whereas I didn't have that risk when I was IT or I didn't have that risk in compliance. Although I got beat up a lot. I must have been. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe I found my third thing. I don't want to find my third thing because I want to retire. Yeah, you're five days in, so... <laughs> Five days in, you're already thinking about the third thing. But I mean, how would it work? I mean, I like the idea of it because I think the false accused thing is obviously taking advantage of these avenue. It's taking advantage of the spirit of what these avenues are supposed to do, right? Um, it's supposed to, you know, I mean, falsely, you know, nobody sets up a, a government hotline for uh, whist- whistleblowers of financial crimes to enable people to take advantage of that to uh you know roast some somebody that it was mean to them do you know what i'm saying so yeah. what would it look like i mean would it look like something where there was sort of teeth or retaliation against people who were making false claims you know what i'm saying i'm just kind of thinking oh, right what it good luck like. with that but but, but heck yes there should be and particularly if you can you can prove there's two kinds of people make that make up the theoretically 50 percent of the false claims the per, the ill-informed nice people who didn't understand what was happening was wrong yeah. about what people were doing or was wrong about the rule of law what they were doing was okay and then there's the people who are just trying to ruin That's somebody a false else. negative basically yeah they, exactly and and we got to have those 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 got to stay in the program they're just an, an unfortunate uh, uh, part of the deal. You can't, you can't get the good, the correct people without getting the faults. And it's a right. beautiful metaphor. However, there, are, what percentage of the fifty percent of the people are wrong are wrong on purpose? Right. And which of those can you even identify for? Hey, you, sorry. Good, good luck with all that. You solved that problem. I can't see. Let me answer your question. <laughs> how, is, how is this all going to roll out? Right. Okay, if I'm correct, it would be like, I don't know, but it's unstoppable. It, it, if this is like the, the rollout of, of microcomputers, there was no stopping that. If it was, even though everybody told me I was an idiot back then, when, it, when, when compliance started, everybody told me I was an idiot and, and it was gonna happen whether I was involved or not. It, it wasn't my idea, it wasn't anybody's idea, it was time was right. Okay, it was happening. And the same thing's happening with this. There will be a correction. The pendulum will swing back from this overcorrection that all people accused of guilt of, 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 of a crime or an unethical behavior are guilty. The idea is patently absurd, but that's what we're doing right now. Right. If you accuse any, co- particularly a company, a leader, a supervisor, a CEO, oh my God, they're all guilty. They're all evil. They're all greedy, except for my Uncle Joe who runs a company. He's wonderful. No, unlike my Uncle Nick who runs a company, who's not only a good guy, but he's, he's teaching others how to be good at this. Okay, you can't stop this. But I'll tell you what, there's going to be some early adopters. There's going to be some noise makers. There's going to be some people who stand on the hill and say, I'm about to get shot in the in 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 the foot <laughs> by other people who are the cancel culture guys 
And they're, they're going to say, how could you possibly ever say anything about whistleblowers that isn't good, that isn't positive, that isn't 100% supportive? You're a bad guy. And, and you know what? It's going to be some guy like the person, the position I'm in. I don't care what they say. They can't take my money. The recession did, but the stock market did. But that'll come back. I don't need their money. I don't need their accolades. I got 23 years of pats on the back. I, I, I appreciate it. I got way more than I deserved. I got gr way more than I needed. I don't need any of this crap. I could be that guy who stands on the hill and starts making noise. Somebody, if any me, it's somebody, right? That's what you said. How's this going to roll out? It's going to roll out whether you want it or not. It's going to roll out whether the cancel culture strikes out against it, in my opinion. The pendulum has swung too far to, 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 for, a, for a, a, a culture like ours, which says that you should get due process. Right. This ain't due process. We just haven't figured out it isn't due process. Nobody is standing up for the false accused. Yeah, and uh, there's, no, there's no downside to make the accusations, to your point. There is no downside to the accusation. And I got to tell you, that, like I said, this, that's for you. You figure that one out. You figure, I'm being facetious. Here. I get it, yeah, yeah. I have no answer for anybody about how to penalize those that maliciously uh, accuse people because you, it's incredibly hard to prove that. And Like and it's, that malicious intent is hard to prove. Exactly. I don't know how, where are you going? Now, maybe they told somebody, maybe they wrote it down. Hang those people from the highest tree. Right. But unfortunately, the false, the, the, the malicious intent guys are going to look just like, in most cases, in my opinion, the, the good hearted people who are just wrong. Exactly. And so let's, let's use that number, right? Let's say that 50% are substantiated and 50% aren't. And let's say that those 50% that aren't, let's, let, let's rule out things like, well, we just couldn't really substantiate it, right? Okay. I'm saying like in that, it's either wrong on purpose or wrong on accident. But okay. I don't know, to your point, how much those, uh, the proportion is of either one of those. Okay, so I, I figured out the answer a, l a little more. It's still hard, right? But okay, you can't penalize people for bringing up potential issues. I would like to see those people left alone forever unless beyond a shadow of a doubt with physical evidence you could prove malicious intent hanging from the highest tree you can't fix the problem there where you can fix the problem is like the french and germans did said okay you can have your hotline you can have your incorrect alleg allegations some of them with malicious intent but we're going to have a process after the issue is reported that protects the people as opposed to shoves them into the public spotlight first. We I, have to start striking out against the press who go after people and ruin their reputation with in, inadequate critical thinking and fact gathering. I don't know. I, I, might, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. Yeah. But just protect the accused. So I, I have an idea. Um, I think this is probably where it's going to go. So think about, you know, in the mid 90s, these compliance programs were kind of just coming out. Uh, these, these hotlines were kind of ju just coming out. Um, and there was kind of both the, uh, there's kind of two components, I think, to the hotline thing. One is the, uh, the sort of dollar efficiency of it, right? Like outsourcing that is good from a dollar standpoint versus kind of yep. stacking on yourself. And then the other one is like sort of the best practice piece because it applies some anonymity, it outsources some liability, it's whatever, right? So those are kind of maybe the two, the two kind of considerations to support this thing. I, my bet is that over the next decade, we're going to see more and more companies not only get their light bulb turned on from a hotline intake perspective, that same, this, those same arguments can be applied to the investigations piece, and they may start outsourcing their investigations. And in that outsource investigation, that can be sort of a lockbox, especially if it's done by a law firm or something, that can be sort of a lockbox to sort of preserve the accused until that recommendation comes out to those people at, you know, those people in charge. I just don't like, I don't know how you fix the old stuff. I'm just saying on a go forward basis, right. that, that may be another kind of, 
I don't know what do you, what do, I guess a lockbox is the only thing to kind of call it a lockbox of the investigation to where that the anonymity on the intake is preserved on sort of the <coughs> intake piece. And then the anonymity of those accused can be sort of preserved in that investigation. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of brainstorming, but okay, maybe so that's an, that's an angle. It's exactly, you're absolutely right. It's where it's got to go. But the first step is it's got to be okay to protect the falsely accused. And right now, anybody who says anything about the uh, whistleblower might be wrong is crucified. The cancel culture will crush them. Any company who starts talking about lockboxes or protecting the accused right now will, will be crucified by the in public by those who, who twist it into somehow you hate whistleblower crowd, which is what they're going to do once you publish this podcast. And by the way, the only request they have is don't you can edit any of the other parts, but from the moment we, you asked the question about whistleblowers till now, keep it all in, no matter how brutally long it is, because if, if you leave anything out, I said they're going to twist my words more than they have. Yeah, right. well, we don't really edit this too much. We kind of keep it nice and, uh, nice and authentic. So uh, Wait, Whatever you want to do on any other stuff, in this, that's cool. Okay, so you answer your question. We, we got to let the people who want to protect the, the, the falsely accused to be able to discuss it, to be able to debate it, to put in pl place things that uh, uh, protect the accused. Uh, and uh, maybe in, if we can prove it, uh, strike out against those who are with intent maliciously maligning people. And, and frankly, social media, the press, we got to be able to discuss it first. And then number two is uh, your idea of lockboxes or protection of, of, of the acute. We just got to work on it more. We can't even talk about it. I know. Unless you're retired okay. you, or you have your own podcast. <laughs> you, well, it, I'm not even sure I discussed this on our podcast. I don't, I, I, but I'll tell you what, you post this thing. And if enough people listen to this whistleblower part, the comment section is going to be fascinating. Totally. Because it's, um, because it's kind of this tightrope. And on, on, on the one side, let's say there's a well-meaning whistleblower who's actually reporting bad behavior to an organization that's supposed to espouse integrity. And they get blackballed and they get roasted after they've done the things you're talking about. And they can't get a job somewhere else because they're on this blacklist of, of whistleblowers. That's not right. And then on the other side of the uh, of the chasm, or on the other side of the uh, you know the tightrope, is this falsely accused thing, where you know the accused, who maybe it's an un unsubstantiated, maybe there's some malicious intent behind the accusation itself, and there's someone hiding behind that veil of anonymity. That's not right. So either side of of the thing is not good, and we only really talk about the one side, though. To your point, riddle be this, Batman. How many people have you heard talk about the problems associated with whistleblowing and defended the falsely accused? How many people are on the that side of the tightrope and speaking out? And how many people are on the other side saying all accused are guilty, all companies are bad, all whistleblowers are correct, all whistleblowers are falsely and negatively and retaliated against. I'm telling you, dude, it's like 10,000 to one. I agree. For every person saying, I think we ought to revisit this topic like the French and, and Germans did, there are 10,000 people with a baseball bat ready to come see you. Just don't tell them where my address is. Man. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting thing though, because based or uh, that, that entire sort of you know, I'll say sort of all whistleblowers are good argument is based on the presupposition that, you know, all whistleblowers are good and that there's never any bad intent on that side. So thus it's either correct or if it's incorrect or unsubstantiated, then it must be because, Hey, I'm just, it was a, you know, it was a hustle mistake. You're like those are the only two options. I'm saying, by the way, the same point. I, I got, I got no problem with people who would say that 95% of people have, good intention when they call the hotline 
That's not my objection. That's not my problem. 5% of them might be malicious, 10, 20, who knows? I don't, it could be zero. I don't figure, care, pretend it's zero. I don't care. I'm just saying we've got to talk more about the fact that a lot of these are wrong. Right. And we've got to be far more careful. And what we got to do is here's what happens right now. There's a whistleblower. According to what I see in Navix, I, I, I got to I got to talk to Navix before I do any more. I say they say their data shows that 50 percent of of I, I, maybe I'm interpreting it wrong. But do, let's say whatever the percentage is, a lot of them are wrong. We have to sp spend more time thinking about and being able to discuss the possibility that some of these whistleblowers are wrong and that recognizing that some accused are going to have irreparable damage because what's happening right now, if you're a whistleblower in our society, in our media, in our social media, you are correct. And the person who you are accusing of something is guilty and needs to be dragged through the mud period and right. let's do it before the facts are gathered or a person is interviewed that regardless of how right i am about anything else i've said in a society that believes in due process that needs to be fixed and it's not going to be fixed until we have as many people on the right side of the or no no i can't use right on the north side of the tightrope as the south side of the tightrope or the east or the west. No, that ain't going to work. I don't know. There's one side and the other side. One side right now has the microphone and they're not letting anybody else have it. All people are accused are guilty and anybody who speaks out otherwise is to be crucified. And then they got one out of 10,000 people on the other side saying, maybe we ought to rethink this and willing to stand there and take the beating. It's and a eventually we'll fix it. it. I mean, it's it's at least a uh, to your point. It's it's at least a dis a disproportionate argument, just from a body standpoint or from a mind share perspective. Go back to the civil debate. You want to get to the truth, my friend. Have a balanced debate. Right. If you want to get to ridiculous, horrifying points in the history of planet Earth, where evil occurred shut down the civil debate, support only one side, and, and let that, that's how evil reigns. We aren't going to solve this or any other problem like it until we have civil debate on the issue, and right now one side won't allow it. I am so in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, then this is good content if that's if that's true. <laughs> right now, I'm all about that. I'm. This is about the only. By the way, this is about the only thing I'm doing right now is cool going out and talking about integrity, talking about the book, trying to push this stuff. I'm sitting around thinking, will anything here trigger my willingness to get back in the game, or go into my shop, or head to Canada and hang out in the wilderness? My plan is family, wilderness, and my shop. And, and for a while, at least, I'm going to do this sort of thing. And uh, I got to tell you, a lot of it might depend on what I get interested in, maybe, but how people react. And if, if, you know, you were to, if, you were to, Nick, if you were to carve this out and say Roy Snell on whistleblowers and publish it on LinkedIn and ask for comments, I mean, yeah, I may cut this exactly. into a little piece that that this is that just carve out that one piece because the problem is it, it, this has been a, a little longer and they might not get to it, and 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 they also might not know it's in there to look for. But if you carve that piece out, I will prove to you that guys like me are just going to get their tails handed to them by the anti defend the guilty crowd, defend defend the innocent, defend the accused crowd. I'm in the one out of 10,000 defend the accused crowd. And, and, and if I'm right, that comment field 
it's just going to be repeat, replete mm -hmm. with Roy is a moron. And well, and, I don't. Yeah, I, you're you're probably right. I mean, it's a totally it. biased view. Yeah, we'll do, do it. it. We'll do I it. I challenge you to to carve it out, highlight it as as. Are, do we have this whistleblower thing right? Do, some controversial, but but honest, fair, mm -hmm. not, not clickbait, but what the discussion was about. Well, because I think it's a, I think it's a really, um, I don't know. Let's let's wrap up, and because I I, I want to sure. kind of talk about what we just talked about. So I appreciate you coming on. This has been a phenomenal uh, conversation. It's you know. Again, I uh, I had a feeling that that we, we were going to be able to get at least two episodes out of this, and we may we may have gotten three. So, I just appreciate your book. I appreciate your friendship and uh, your willingness to share your insights that you've gathered over the years, and uh, your perspective. You you're a unique voice in in, in this compliance game, and uh, I just appreciate you spending some of your afternoon with me. I know time is tight I, for you now. I I I have absolutely enjoyed it sir and i would love to think of an excuse to do something like this again i think your perspective on this your attitude your, your by the way very positive attitude your, and and uh, the people you surround yourself with uh i just i love it dude and I'm, I'm glad we ran into each other i remember you coming by the booth last year didn't you do that i did yeah and and Karen looked at me after, who was that guy? <laughs> it, it, you're, you're an absolute anomaly, fascinating, interesting. I haven't quite got it figured out yet, sir. All I know is it, it's uh, real good. I really appreciate uh, being able to do this. I hope we find an excuse to do some more. Absolutely. All right, I appreciate man. That. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on.